So again, five minutes and uh, anything you like. Thank Since you. I get five minutes, I'm going to come out here amongst you. <laughs> I think the single statistic that ought to dominate the debate for U.S. Senate in Michigan in 2012 is this. And I don't know how many of you watch politicians on TV, you know, an entrepreneur or a small business owner creates a job and the politicians go on TV and say, here's all the jobs we created. And we, I, you should roll your eyes. But since they're quick to claim credit, surely Debbie Stabenow will accept responsibility for the fact that in the 10 years she's been in the United States Senate, Michigan has lost 800,000 private sector jobs. That is the worst job loss in America. You're confident as I am, Debbie will accept responsibility, right? Yeah. On her watch? Uh -huh. Well, there's a lot of things that we could do to create jobs, but let me share with you three things I would promote as a United States Senator if you see fit to send me back to Washington. Number one, we've already talked about a little bit. Pass a state right to work law, pass a national right to work law. It is not just a freedom issue and a civil rights issue, and in my opinion, a moral issue. It is a jobs issue. It is one of the most significant factors. In fact, half the country, half the companies in this uh, country won't even look at a state that doesn't have a right to work law for a new plant site. Some of the corporations around the world won't look at any states in America except those that have right to work laws. How many new auto plants have been built in Michigan in the last quarter century? One, zero. How many in Alabama and Tennessee and South Carolina and North Carolina? We ought to pass a national right to work law so that all 50 states, including Michigan, can be competitive in a global marketplace for new plant site locations and new jobs. Number two, drill baby drill and frack baby frack. There is an estimated trillion barrels of oil in the 50 United States. We should be an oil exporting country. We should sell it to other countries and use the proceeds to pay down our $15 trillion debt. We ought to be able to tell Saudi Arabia and Iran to go pound their ample supply of sand. We don't need their oil. We will be secure from a national security standpoint. And Penn State says if we'll explore and harvest our oil resources, we'll create at least 800,000 new American oil and gas jobs. New jobs, energy security, national security. Number three, dramatically reduce or in some cases eliminate the federal inheritance, <laughs> capital gains, personal income, and certainly corporate income tax. Let me just give you an example. There's an estimated $1.2 trillion in Cayman Islands and Swiss bank accounts that American companies have made in other countries, which they won't bring back on shore to create American jobs, because as soon as they hit the beach, they got to write a 40% check to the federal government. If it was your money, where would you invest it? In a country that taxed you 40% or Ireland that taxes you 9%? and has become a magnet for new corporate relocation from all over the world. If we want to create American jobs with that money, we've got to bring it back on shore and be competitive. You know, Ronald Reagan reminded us of what we face as a nation right now, even when he talked about it back in 1980. We're in a recession. You know that when somebody you know has lost their job. It becomes a depression if you or a member of your family lose your job. We'll know we're on the road to recovery when Barack Obama and Debbie Stabenow lose their jobs. <laughs> now the way we as human beings, human nature, natural law, no matter what country, no matter what point in history, wherever we are on the planet, the way we react to repression and confiscatory taxation and big government is the same. We hunker down, we try to hold on to what we got. We don't invest, we don't spend, Half of all Americans are afraid to spend money on Christmas this year. But the way we respond to freedom and incentive and reward as human beings is also the same. And it was those freedom principles, moral and liberty and economic, that made us not only an economic powerhouse through most of the history of this country, but a force for moral good and freedom throughout the world. If we will simply restore those founding principles, we can make Michigan and America great again. We're a great country. We are an exceptional people because we've been exceptionally blessed, but we're not being governed that way. We can, because we are Americans, meet these challenges and turn the light of liberty back on in this shining city on a hill. Certainly it's my prayer that God will bless America, but I think we ought to be more focused on being worthy of those blessings. So I would say God heal 
protect and preserve the United States of America while giving us one more chance to restore those founding principles so we can pass on to our children what we got from our parents and grandparents, a free country. Thank you very much. I started holding this up earlier. We've got to do something to fix our country. We need the right tool. We need to do it, and we need to do it quickly, because we're within a handful of years of throwing this country away. And again, the house that's on fire is the debt. And I hate to talk about something that's negative. Certainly, we need to do all we can to prop up this economy. The regulations are stifling business. The tax system is wrecking it. There's so much we need to do to get the economy going. There are people eager to start new businesses and expand business. We must do that. But 42 cents of every dollar the federal government spending is borrowed, much of that from China and other countries. As I said earlier, the debt is growing at $76,000 every second with no sense of turning around. Our leaders in Washington don't know what it is we need to cut. We know we need to cut something. They don't know what it is. And I've already suggested to you through a couple of my statements that the area that doesn't fit, the tie that doesn't fit, is the area of means-tested welfare. We, it has grown 13 times since it, we started the war on poverty, taking into consideration inflation. Food stamps, just food stamps in Kent County, where I come from. Guess how much they cost? How much one year for food? That's only 9% of the welfare budget. $200 million a year. If you stop those food stamps today, how many people are going to starve to death in Kent County? Everyone I've asked in Kent County says nothing. Then the church, nonprofits, neighbors are going to start doing what you're supposed to do. That's our job. Real compassion means to suffer with people. It's to be there with them and help them. That's our privilege. I get a blessing when I help the poor. I don't get that blessing paying my taxes. We need to do that. So that is an area that we need to, to, to move back to nonprofits and churches. And we've got a program in Kent County we started called Social Enterprise. There's a guy that runs a business in Kent County. There's other businesses that are getting involved. I'm becoming a cheerleader for this program. This fellow has moved in the last eight years 400 people from welfare to sustainable work. And 63% of them after eight years are still off welfare. It's ingenious. It can be replicated anywhere. I'm starting right now. My personal goal, because I'm a cheerleader for this, even before I become a senator, is to move 10% of the people on welfare in Michigan from welfare to sustainable work between now and November when the election is. That's a gutsy thing to do, but we've got to start. Now, we can't wait till January of 2013. Okay, I want to end with this final thing. We started with the Pledge of Allegiance. What does it say? One nation under God, indivisible. Are we under God as a, as a country today? You know, our government is a lagging indicator of where the culture is. And is American culture healthy today? It reflects our culture. And that's more a province of churches and family than it is government. We've got a role to play. Each one of us has a role to play. I'm not taking PAC money, but we've got a pact. Heckman Pact. P, prayer. Not just sprinkle pixie dust out of God bless America, but real earnest prayer for our country. We need him more than ever today. A, ask God what does he want you to do. None of us, what good guys as we are, we're not going to go with a magic wand to Washington, wave it over the Capitol building, it's all going to be, no. Everyone, it's, this is like December 7, 1941. This is like 1776, all hands on deck. We need you to do, ask what God wants you to do. C, do it courageously, obey, obey. And then together with the rest of us. And we can turn it around. We have to turn it around. Stand up, Marcia. She's my best friend, wife of 42 years. Mother of our 12 children. She had them all. In the future, we also have 21 grandkids. And I know you all care about your future too, but we're going to give it away. The hundreds of thousands of men and women that have given their lives so that we could enjoy just be here today and talk these things. This is a privilege. And we're within a handful of years just to say, oh, we don't care. That's why I'm running. I don't really care about being a senator. I'm going to be honest with you. It sounds like a lot of work to me. But it is a leverage point for me. 
I want to change this thing. Just like I changed juvenile court. I was a puny little 27 year old. But by the grace of God, and through his power, and through prayer, and through a lot of hard work, we changed it. And I believe one person can make a difference. And I want to be that person. Thank you very much. Thank you, Randy. And uh, Peter. Peter Kenechi uh, has five minutes now from Roscoe. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Roscoe. Close enough. Whatever. <laughs> well, I tell you, the biggest difference uh, between our current group of politicians in Washington <coughs> and our founding fathers are that our founding fathers understood the concept of limited government and they understood the concept of personal liberty. I'm totally, totally impressed by it. They fought a war against the greatest nation on earth and obviously won against Britain. And that was a feat in itself, but it wasn't the biggest feat. The biggest feat is the type of government they set up thereafter. And they set up a government that was dedicated to securing our liberty actually securing our living. And the only function the federal government is authorized to perform are national functions. They can do national defense primarily, national immigration, and other national functions, setting up the patent office, weights and measures, and things like that. Our federal government has no authority whatsoever to interfere in any aspect of the daily lives of the people. None. They have no authority whatsoever to be involved in education, health and human services, energy, transportation, labor, else. The Environmental Protection Agency is a, a huge fiasco. But they do it anyways. And why do they do it? We have to ask ourselves, is there any function the federal government performs that we're proud of or that, or that they do efficiently? And I can't think of any. I've had uh, many, many Tea Party groups that I've talked to. I've posed that question and there's not one um, program that I can think of that the federal government performs efficiently. So then we have to ask ourselves, why are we allowing the federal government to impose all of these programs and restrictions on us? There's, there's no reason whatsoever. Over the last 40, 50 years, the government programs have focused on making us a submissive group of people. You know, we're no longer a free, independent, responsible people. They've taken trillions of dollars and they've transferred it from those that produce to create a dependent class so that this dependent class would vote for bigger government over and over and over again. And it's destroying our nation. When I look around, um, I see a lot of people at the state level and at the local level, and they go into the federal level. And I think to myself, you know, what are the problems with this? And if you're at the state level or the local level, your job is to take care of the people plow the roads, you provide for their, for their education, you, uh, you know, do whatever else needs to be done at the local level. At the federal government, it's completely different. The federal government should not take care of the needs of the people. What the federal government should do, as the Declaration of Independence says, and as our founders said, is to secure our life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and to allow a free people, through their own personal endeavor, through voluntary charity, through the free market, or if they decide some sort of government intervention is needed, then through the states to take care of the needs of the people. And that's why it's so critical that the states can provide any program that the people desire government oversight. Right to work is a primary example. There's a lot of other ones. Marriage, there's a lot of you know, other situations. The problem is, is if the government gets involved in these programs, they are going to screw them up. They will. There's no doubt that we have a proven history over time. The government screws everything up. My entire goal in Washington is to limit the federal government's power and authority back to the specific enumerated duties. That's it. Limit it to the specific enumerated duties. People say one person can't make a difference, but they can. And there's a lot of people in Washington that want to change the scope and power of government. I know Rand Paul, as an example, wants to do it. Ron Paul's father in the House. Jim DeMint wants to do it. Michelle Bachman. Every single House Republican that got elected in 2010 got elected based on Tea Party principles to decrease the size of government and restore the personal liberty to the people. I'm extremely disappointed that virtually every single one of them folded on key issues. It's, it's terrible. I have no sympathy for them. And if people are running against them in a primary, I would support whoever runs against them. 
But the point is, is that they did get elected based on Tea Party principles, and we have to make sure that these Tea Party principles are carried forward in the 2012 election. I am not a professional politician, none whatsoever. I've just been a businessman for the last 35 years. Um, I've never been rich. Um, I've always been self-sufficient, never taken uh, public charity. But um, I know that the only way we're ever going to save this nation is if we have people in Washington that want to limit the scope and power of the federal government back to its normal duties. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chuck Marino from Brighton. Five minutes. In the book of Isaiah, it says that God finds delight in your prosperity. President Obama and Debbie Stabenow goes around the world, and what they like to do is apologize for the United States' prosperity. And I don't know, but if my son went around and apologized for the things I did for him, I wouldn't be very happy with that. <laughs> Also, when George Washington came to this country and he fought his wars and he did a great job for us, the Congress wanted to set him up as a ruling entity. And he said we didn't leave tyranny in order to set up a monarch. But yet our politicians think they're in a monarch situation. All you have to do is look at a couple basic facts. First of all, if you invest with a local guy that invests your money, in the stock market. On average, he makes five and a half, six percent, six percent on your money. If you took it and gave it to a hedge fund manager, he makes about eight percent. If you gave that same money to somebody in Congress, they make 13 percent. Now, this is ridiculous that these people have inside trading and trading, and they continue to do inside trading and they see nothing wrong with this. Another study that came out was people who go into Congress and run for Congress. One of the things that they do is they looked at their income before they went to Congress. There was a senator, and I won't mention his name, but he was making $169,000 a year before he joined Congress. That's a pretty good living. When he was in Congress, he made $11 million a year. I think that's disgusting. They set themselves up at royalty. And I agree with Randy. One of the things we have to do is we have to not only limit the pay, but we have to tie it in just like business people do, profit shares. We also have to limit their, their benefits. You know, I think it's ridiculous that a lot of times with Congress and with our presidents, that a lot of them retire as millionaires, but yet they still get to draw their pensions. The pension system was set up for Truman, and Truman almost died a broke man. And they wanted to make sure that never happened to another president. And there should be no reason why anybody that leaves Congress or leaves the presidency should be able to take a pension while he's a millionaire. Now, if he drops below a certain level, whatever the national level was, of income, say it's $50,000, surely he should get some kind of pension. But up until that point, he should forego the pension. I think this just makes common sense. I am a businessman. I've never been a politician. I ran for office because of the fact that I thought that Debbie Stabenow was doing a lot of things wrong, and I thought she was really handing us, I think, what was ineffective legislation across the board. The way that you fix the problems of what we have is go back to basics. I was a football coach for a number of years. Let me give you a quick football story. There was a kid down in, um, I think it was Florida, and this kid was nine years old, and he was a great running back. Every time he touched the ball, he was four points. Every time he was on defense, he tackled the guy with the ball. And he was a super football player. In our society, you know what we did with him? We sat him on the bench, <coughs> could only play one quarter, and the rest of the game was played without him. We're in a society of mediocrity. And if we decide that that's what we want is mediocrity, we're never going to get back to the statue we used to be. And that's what's going on in this country. There's three basic principles that I know in football or in business. And these are the three basic principles of, of the Republican Party and our country. And it first starts with the belief in God. We've always been a Judeo Christian country, and we've got to go back to those same beliefs. And our freedoms come from God. And we have to remind ourselves that our forefathers were really smart men. They said something in the Constitution that said, these freedoms are from God. 
they made sure that we all understood they were from God because no man can take them away. And when men try to take them away, we're in trouble. Only God can take them away. Secondly, we're Constitution people. We follow the Constitution. We've got judges that are now deciding they're going <clears> to <throat> judge cases on Sharia law. Sharia law right now, a judge in, in Florida decided he was going to judge a case on Sharia law. We should go back to teaching the Constitution in schools. And third, we're a capitalist society. We're a free market society. If you look at every situation and you apply free market uh, solutions to those problems, I guarantee you our country would be back on the right track. Ronald Reagan said, freedom is generational. It's not in your bloodline. It's not something you can inherit. It's something you have to fight for. I'm asking you to join with me. Send somebody to Washington with new ideas to fix our problems. Thank you. Chuck Marino and now Scotty Goldman. Five minutes. By the way, I think you need a plumber's wrench. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, I have a lot of opinions on a lot of things. There's no way I could get to all of it or even fully elaborate on one in five minutes. Um, Bowman12.org, I got a few things printed, but again, not enough. If you have questions, you want more in-depth answers, I have a little form you can fill out, ask a question, and you know, submit it, and I'll, I'll address that in greater detail. Um, all of my opinions though, are derived from a basic idea, and what I do when I come up with an opinion, sometimes it breaks from what one would pigeonhole as conservative, liberal, even libertarian. Um, because I start out with just one basic idea. I start out with what is the role of government? The government should protect my fundamental rights to life, liberty, and property. And they go together because I have to live first or I'm, I'm just not. Then I, need, I can make choices. And with those choices, I can produce property or I can trade for property. These things are all extensions of myself. It's the right of a person to live for their own sake. The government is a tool to help secure those rights that we work with collectively among ourselves, a shared effort to have a tool to secure our rights. If a government is not doing that, then it is out of line. And it is more than likely violating somebody's rights. Now, part of that, in order to be secure, is to defend our nation as a whole. That's part of defending our rights collectively now from an external force taking that from us. Um, I didn't have quite a chance to elaborate, so some people may have thought I was a pacifist over here on the Taiwan thing, I'm not. Um, I believe in a very strong national defense. I think that defense is weakened if we end up having to take on the burden of other people's national defenses. I'm for helping people get off their dependency on U.S. protection. But um, ultimately, it's their responsibility. We need to have a sustainable economy and it's sustainable in defense for America. Um, financially, there is um, one big, giant thing that we left out of the discussion tonight, and I'm going to get to it now briefly. The Federal Reserve System. Yes. Just to kind of and do it, and this is only an analogy, it's much more complicated than that. Read Creature from Jekyll Island by Griffin, if you want to know more. Um, but picture this. Imagine you're a college student, you just got in there, and the credit card company, you got perfect credit because you haven't gotten in debt yet gives you a big juicy credit card. Now you can party. You take out the girls, you treat your friends to big parties, you buy dinner for everybody, whatever you want. It's like you're a rich guy and prosperity follows you. Everyone around you is now prosperous. This is going great. It's like instant prosperity. And whenever you think you're low on money, oh, I got the credit card. This fixes it. It's all good now. And so for years we've been thinking we've got all this prosperity going along. And hey, look, it, that isn't a problem. I've got this big debt, but look how good I'm doing. I got all this stuff. Um, and so we've been thinking, you know, and the economists have been trying to make us believe that somehow debt is not a problem. Well, eventually it is, though, because at some point, oh, I reach my limit. What am I going to do? I get another credit card. <laughs> or in the case of you only got one, like the Federal Reserve, oh, I guess I'll just have to get my credit limit increased. They call that debt ceiling. And so you just get more. And now we got more debt. And you know what? They don't mind because you have to keep making bigger and bigger payments and paying more and more interest. Well, the Federal 
Reserve is a cartel of private banks that are collecting money off that interest. They're getting rich off our debt. And as long as they have the certainty that we're going to keep paying up, they don't care how in debt everyone in this country becomes. And it is, if you had, I've seen figures, hundreds of thousands of dollars per person. I mean, it's ridiculous when you break it down on the per capita level. Um, so that's, that's one thing you've got to realize, that we have this big monster there, and you don't hear about it much. Why? Because, well, they have something called the discount window. And what it basically means, it's kind of like a, term, a slang phrase. But the idea is there's certain people who are eligible for loans with no interest, and foreign governments even, to get loans with no interest. And often it's not even reported because of the fact that they have Federal Reserve secrecy. They only get audited on certain items, but not the important ones. So we need to end the Federal Reserve System. We did not always have one. This government got by great without one for a long, country got by great without one for a long time. Now there's a brief period where, oh wait, the economy got even better after we had a Federal Reserve. Well, they, it's like the young college kid going and getting in debt on his big credit card. So that's one tool. Oh, and as far as the state going broke and the federal government, we're depending on it because they have the Federal Reserve System. The states don't. And so our money is diminished in value. You need Social Security, the money you save for retirement is lowering in value. Saving is a loss. Thank you very much.